You are listening to Joygasm, a video game and movie podcast. I'm Russ, Xbox Live Toaster 360. He's Steve, Xbox Live Steve Mitch. And we're both out of toilet paper in episode 164 today, March 15th, 2020. We're going to be catching up with each other before we go into our topic of the day, which is Ori and the Will of the Wisps impressions, which you can fast forward to if you look at the timestamps located below. Other than that, you just keep on listening. Steve, I, it's been a little while since I've talked to my brother from the same mother. You staying healthy over there? Oh, we're staying healthy. You know, um, it's funny because everybody laughs during, uh, you know, the, the, the cold season or a flu season or, or just, you know, hay fever season when uh, I, I tell folks, hey, you mind covering your mouth? You just sneezed and you're two feet away from me. All right. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm literally breathing in your sneeze right now. Can you cover your mouth? And everyone's like, Psh, you're such a germaphobe. I'm like, man, it's okay. It's okay if I sneeze and not cover my mouth and spew what was in my body out into the air for everybody to breathe. I'm like, you know oh, what? Yeah. I just don't like it. I mean, consider, you know, maybe, maybe it's just a pet peeve. You know what I mean? Um, and so everybody like laughs and goes, man, you're so, you're so like, so conscious about it. Like relax. Well, who is relaxing now? Okay. <laughs> Who's relaxing now? Who's going to call who crazy? Okay. I, I'm telling you, the, the worst ones is when like a person sneezes and it's like the sunlight is backlighting them as they do it. So you get to see oh. like everything make a mass exodus out of their nose and mouth. <laughs> so gross. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's funny because a lot of folks uh, during flu season, there, there's not quite the fear of getting the flu and no one likes the flu. Uh, but this has definitely got folks. Uh, well, I think it's two sides. I think the one side is folks are like are, are, are scared to, to get the the virus, but the other side is going like, "Hey, um, I don't want to get it. I want to stay healthy, but please don't buy you know seventeen all seventeen thousand Purell bottles because I'd like to have one, uh, or don't buy all the toilet paper uh, because I would like to buy a couple rolls." Um, and so I think the other side is going like, I don't, we don't need to panic quite yet. Um, but if we don't go out and buy the proper stuff, uh, then it's all going to be bought and we're not going to get any just because we want to have some, you know? And so, yeah, there, there's a <laughs> all weirdness kind of to, it. to funnel through the panic. Well, and I, th I think it's, yeah, it's interesting in the sense that on the one hand, you have folks who have health problems or maybe they're the elderly and they're just more susceptible to having dire consequences to this type of virus and definitely want to protect them and, and watch out for them, make sure that, that they're not taking unnecessary trips and that sort of thing. And then you have folks who have really been influenced by the media and the media is just hyping this up to no end uh, really before we have the proper amount of information at hand. And so I think w as a result, you're having folks who are uh, responding to the headlines and I'm not, not to say that I'm like trying to discount the seriousness of the virus or anything like that. But when it comes to like the the crazy shopping that was going on, I think I think you saw Steve. I posted a picture. I, I should probably post it on the Joygasm site. But my daughter and I were at a Target in San Mateo, California, and the entire like both sides of the aisle that was usually the the toilet paper aisle was completely bare. Like there was not one single uh, package of toilet paper to be found whatsoever, and that was a big aisle. And what's interesting to me is how this type of behavior is actually causing folks who perhaps are not as panicked about the situation to all of a sudden have to adopt the same type of purchasing mentality that the other folks are having, just like you said, so they can actually have kind of the commodities that they need to use on a daily basis. <laughs> and so like, you know, my, my wife and daughter have been visiting me uh, over in the, the San Francisco Bay area for the last week and a half. And it's been interesting to, to see, we, we've actually bumped up her flight by a day just because of some of the different 
events that have transpired within the last couple of days. And I told her, I said, yeah, best of luck when you, when you go to the grocery stores and whatnot, hopefully you'll be able to find what you need. I will say though, as like kind of a public service announcement of sorts that Amazon can probably hook you up. Like if you're in your local area and you can't find certain things like toilet paper or even food, you can go on Amazon and they'll have most of what you're looking for. And so um, until Amazon decides that they're going to have to quarantine all of the, the delivery folks and that sort of thing, that could be a plan B that could work for all of you. But yeah, it, it's interesting. I, I was curious to hear your thoughts on just what has the, the, the general mindset that you've seen in your area of Texas? Well, wh- how have people been responding to it up until now? Well, you have very few people. I mean, I, I've been out. I go to the store uh, every day because I'll get a salad or, or something uh, at my local you know, grocery store or whatever. Or maybe uh, some rice lunch. cakes. <laughs> or maybe some rice cakes. But And so some people will wear uh, these masks. But uh, the, the, you know, the Costco's and a lot of the stores, they're actually having people wipe down carts as you bring them into the store. Um, and they're, they are taking preventative measures. Um, but... The, the general consensus, at least in my area, is that, um, I mean, folks don't really know what to believe at this point. They, know, they do know that some folks are getting sick, um, but that, you know, there, there's not a whole lot of folks that are actually dying uh, quite yet. Uh, people are trying to be as clean as they can, um, but they, and, and, but by and large, some of the larger corporations are saying to, to their folks, hey, stay home. Uh, we'll do video conferencing if we have to. Don't go out and meet with clients or whatever. Um, and I actually had somebody from um, the, the place that I work uh, text me and saying, what are you doing to combat the, convo- the, the coronavirus? And I said, well, I'm quarantining myself in my office. I'm, I don't know what else to do. I mean, I, I sit in an office and I make uh, calls out uh, to folks. Um, and so uh, anyhow... Like I don't, I, I don't really see a whole lot of people on a daily basis, and my office has about five people in it. So, uh, it, you know, it, it's not that uh, you know we're we're kind of putting ourselves out into, into, into big public areas. But um, my neighbor actually, I went to say hi to him yesterday before I uh, went to get my my car uh, smogged, and uh, he looked at me. And he said, "So, do you have any food?" I went, uh, "Well, what do you mean? I mean, I, I, I think I have like a week's worth, but um, like." why? And he goes, oh, I was taking pictures uh, at the store and, and the local store is almost out of food. And I'm like, that's impossible. And he, yeah, sure enough, like the bread aisle is gone. Uh, and the meat aisle was looking pretty, uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> pretty, pretty empty. And so it, I think a lot of folks are just are buying into, they're not buying into the fact that they're getting, that, that, that this is going to be the next uh, Ebola virus, but I think they're buying into the fact that, hey, if I don't f- stock up on food, depending on what the government decides to do or what corporations and, and grocery stores decide to do, I might not be able to get any and I have to feed my family. Uh, so I think there's more out here anyway, there's more of a panic for that than actually you know, getting sick and, and, uh, uh, and having serious health concerns. Yeah, and I think that that could also possibly be the case over on the West Coast as well. I mean, the West Coast has a bit more of a situation with different folks who have tested positive for the coronavirus. And so it's, they're a bit more Johnny on the spot. You know, I've actually been pretty impressed with how um, the folks in, in the States over here have been pivoting. Uh, to meet the the growing crisis that's going on. And, and so I think that's all well and good. Even 2K Games, what was interesting was we had a staff meeting and they told us that um, it, it was optional for folks, if, if they didn't want to come into the office to work, that they could actually take their workstations home with them and work from home over the next two weeks. I, uh, at this point, have elected to stay just because the office itself is going to pretty much be a ghost town. I think probably 95% of the, of the employees are going to be working from home. And so as far as I'm concerned, I'm thinking, well, there's going to be hardly anybody at the office. That means the likelihood of uh, catching something there is going to be extremely low. And we'll just have to see. I, I was, I was talking to my uh, supervisor about it and was just saying, Hey, uh, to me, it's a very fluid situation. I think that if there are additional 
types of um, travel bans or other types of situations that intensify that I may end up changing my mind and then making it a point to work from home myself. And they are completely understanding of that. I really appreciate how accommodating they have been. And they pulled me aside one-on-one privately. and was just like, yeah, we know that, that you're not, uh, your house and family are not in California. Are you okay? Like what, you know, you just tell us what you want to do and we'll be backing you up a hundred percent. So I, I was pretty thankful for that. Are you there, Steve? I am here. Okay. I was worried the virus got you already while I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that was a question I should answer. So I was like, okay, well, that's good. Well, I, I didn't <laughs> want to keep on talking. I want to make sure you have a little bit of a say too, you know. <laughs> so. <sighs> Anyhow. Uh, so have you been able to uh, game or anything or watch any movies with this, with everything going on? What have I been doing? You know, I actually watched Contagion which came out a while ago. I don't remember what year it came out, but I forgot. that. Was, did you know that was a Steven Soderbergh film? No. So Steven Soderbergh, I don't know if you know who he is, but he's the director of, of movies like Aaron Brockovich and Traffic. Yeah, I'm sure you've seen those. Ocean's 11, uh, Ocean's 12, yeah, Ocean's 13. Both. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I totally forgot that, that he was one who directed that film and, and it's actually pretty interesting to watch. I was struck by a lot of the similarities of what we're seeing with this type of coronavirus situation as the fictional movie was kind of having a, um, a exploration on. And so in the movie, once again, you have some kind of virus that was started through animals, uh, in China and having it kind of, uh, you watch as this domino effect occurs and it's been very, um, I don't know, like, like when I saw the, the movie in theaters, I remember not being as impressed with it as I was with like, say the movie outbreak with, uh, Kevin Spacey and Renee Russo. And I can't remember who all was in there, but, um, Morgan Freeman was Ooh, in Dustin it. Dustin Hoffman. And- Dustin Hoffman in it? Yeah, yeah. Dustin Hoffman was in it. And, and that has been like probably my, my favorite uh, virus-oriented <laughs> film. But when it comes to, to this in particular, though, like I said earlier, I was really struck by a lot of the similarities, even some of the, the, the medical talk, some of the medical terms and that sort of thing are in line with some of the the different terms I've read in the articles and as well as the press briefings from like the CDC and that sort of thing. So it's, it's really funny because I had actually found out about how that particular movie has been rented and watched a ton over the last month or so. And so I ended up watching it myself. I was like, well, yeah, this does make a lot of sense. It's, it's pretty interesting to me. Have you seen that movie or not? No, not none of those. I mean, I've seen Outbreak. I mean, you know that, but none of the other ones. Yeah. I also think it's interesting how so many things have actually been canceled. You know, the game developers conference was canceled. E3 has now officially been canceled. WonderCon has been canceled. I think a lot of folks are turning towards San Diego Comic-Con and wondering if that too will get canceled or not. Typically that conference doesn't occur until late June, early July, somewhere around there. So we'll have to see what ends up happening because you have probably a hundred thousand plus folks who are squished together in a fire marshal nightmare of a situation. And I, (laughs) if this stuff is not buttoned up by June, I think that's probably going to be canceled as well. You had the NBA that, that has suspended games and whatnot uh, until further notice. And I, but at the same time, even though all this stuff sucks, I'm glad that they're doing it. I really am. I think that, that, that this is a responsible um, answer to trying to contain what's happening. And I think if you continue having these, these massive events that have large gatherings, you're just inviting more and more chaos to ensue. So it's, it's, don't get me wrong. It's unfortunate that all these things are, are, uh, not going to necessarily happen this year, but it is amazing to think about how trivial these things are in relation to one's health. So very, very interesting time indeed over here. Uh, what have you been watching, Steve? What have you been playing? <clears throat> well, let's see. So I've been uh, making my way through 
God of War. I'm now, uh, let's see if, uh, well, where am I? Uh, I just got through a walk and, um, uh, our, I don't know, getting rid of the black breath, uh, if that makes any sense uh, to you in the game. Probably should, since you've uh, played beating the game. Black breath. Uh, so it's been a black while. Black breath. So is that the I official name or is that the name that little, you gave it? No, that that's the official. Yeah, I just came up with it, Russ. Um, well, I, no, I don't know. That's the, <laughs> that's the official name. Russ, can you play the game? So I had to go defeat a bunch of these dark elves. And um, and then one of the elves said, hey, you, you know, you're on the wrong side. You don't know what you just did. Uh, and so the kid wrote in his little journal, like, you know, did we do the right thing or do we not do the right thing? Or, you know, whatever, right, wrong, but I don't know. We shouldn't probably never even got involved, which, I mean, they attacked me when I was just walking through. So I really didn't have a choice but to attack them back to save my own life. Uh, so I thought that was kind of odd that, hey, you attacked me. I defended myself. And by defending myself, I slaughtered you all. Uh, <laughs> so oopsie daisy on, guess, both of our parts. Maybe we should have both thought first. Or maybe, you look, maybe you should have looked to communicate with me a little bit before you just started to attack me and my son. I don't know. Anyway. So I got the little artifact that I was supposed to get uh, to make my way up to the, the mountain of giants. Um, and I had, to, I had to use the artifact to get rid of the black breath so that I could get up uh, the mountain. So anyway, that's where I'm saved there. I stopped playing, of course, because Ori came out uh, on Wednesday. And so I've been playing nothing but Ori uh, and the Will of the Wisps uh, ever since Wednesday. But uh, I did watch a couple movies. I actually... <laughs> You're going to laugh, but I did watch uh, X-Men Dark Phoenix, which is, um, uh, it's pretty unfortunate. A lot of folks <laughs> don't really care for the movie. Uh, I, I would have to agree with them, but it's not, it, it's, it's, it's more so like, you know, the movie is about Jean Grey becoming Phoenix, of course, uh, but the actress who plays Jean Grey can't really deliver her lines and the lines that she's given aren't very good either it seems like everybody else did a, a fairly good job with the movie uh, all the actors and actresses did did absolutely fine the story was fine it's just every time Jean Grey was on screen who's the main character the lines that she's given and the way she delivered those lines that she's given are, are t- pretty terrible uh, and so it, it makes it difficult to to follow and, and enjoy uh, quite honestly but so that that's unfortunate because it did have potential I think it had potential uh, anyhow, I did watch also The Hitman's Bodyguard, which was, you know, Ryan Reynolds and Samuel Jackson are in it. I mean, it's your, your, I guess, classic popcorn action flick. Nothing too special about it, but. Um, yeah, I've seen that. One, but um, anyhow. Um, and then you're going to laugh because I haven't, I only watched the first one and now I watched the last one of Rambo. I haven't watched <laughs> any of the in-between ones. I just. I don't. I, th- I think I put it on my Netflix list a long time ago, and then it finally came to position one. <laughs> so I finally watched it, and yeah, that was kind of a whatever, but um, not not terrible. But again, kind of like Hitman's Bodyguard, it was a, you know just popcorn action, but um, not terrible, but not great. Um, and um, that's about it. That, that's about uh, caught up with me. Oh, But there's only thing left to do when you're quarantined, and that's our topic of the day. topic of the day is Ori and the Will of the Wisps impressions. This game dropped finally this week earlier. I think it was like March 11th that it finally made its official debut. I have personally been waiting for this game to come out for a long time. I believe I've been waiting for five years to be exact. And so I am very, very tickled to finally go back into this world. I thought I would uh, be able to kick things off 
since I've been a huge fan of Ori in the Blind Forest. I actually beat that title. I absolutely loved it. I thought that it was a terrific example of how side scrolling platformers can still be very legit in today's next gen world. And when it comes to Ori and the Will of the Wisps, um, I'm absolutely on cloud nine about how they have continued the, this, this story in their latest chapter. And there are so many things that they have um, just improved upon from the first title itself. Steve, did you play the first Ori and the Blind Forest title or not? No, I have not. As a matter of fact, I was about to ask you, why don't you give all the listeners uh, <laughs> who might be like myself, who had not played the first one, why don't you give us a little rundown uh, about what happened in the story? So we yeah. don't know what to expect from this one. They So the first one was um, kind of a bit on the abstract side, but essentially... Um, you have a, a character. So I can't remember the character's name, but he's kind of the bigger character that you see kind of toward the intro there. He is um, Ori's buddy. And there, it, there was like some sort of big storm and like some of the, um, essentially a lot of the wildlife was starting to die out. Like there was, there was something where uh, when it was once plentiful of food and, rain and that sort of thing. They're just all the vegetation and, and the, the environment that they lived in was, was slowly but surely being choked out and dying. And, and, um, Ori's friend ends up just kind of falling ill of sorts. If And, and so Ori sets out on this mission to try and find more food and figure out just what the heck's going on. And as he does, he is, met with um, just going beyond what he's used to, what he knows, almost like a Lord of the Rings style thing of putting one foot in front of the other kind of thing. Um, and so it's great because he gets into all of these different types of environments and worlds and he's able to slowly but surely uh, put bring balance back, so to speak, into uh, the world and he's having to fend off huge creatures and that sort of thing and um, and he ends up meeting another character who was once evil. He's kind of the spider looking character. I can't remember his name either, but, but he ends up, um, you kind of like win him over, you bring him out of the, the dark side and into the light side, so to speak of the force. And it's cool to see him back into this title as well. So the end of Ori in the blind forest is that Ori is the hero. He's able to restore the lands back to their, their normal uh, flourishing bountiful selves. And he's able to rejoin his buddies and everything is all, you know, honky dory at that point in time. Okay. So up to the, the will of the wisps, um, I guess you meet an owl. Um, I don't know if did that happen in the beginning where you met the owl or you just kind of, or did we just meet him for the first time with this game? So the owl is interesting because, um, there was kind of like almost a final boss, if you will, um, from Ori in the blind forest, which was this huge owl. And if I remember correctly, the owl was actually defending its nest and, I think I think that's what, like as the story goes. Ori thinks at first that the owl is evil and whatnot, but actually comes to realize that the owl is protecting its its nest and that sort of thing. And so when the when the owl perishes, um, there's an egg in the nest, and so it or it's up to Ori to bring the egg back and uh, try and get it to hatch. And so that so you're, what you're seeing in in the Will of the Wisps is that that baby owl is the offspring of that huge owl. That was from the first title. Gotcha. So I guess this one has a similarity in that uh, when when you start this game, you're on cloud nine in a sense where uh, Ori is flying around with Owly. Uh, I don't know what his name is. <laughs> That's his name. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and then they fall into a storm and then they land into a different area of the forest, it seems. And... Uh, Ori is basically just trying to get back to his buddy. And the area the, of the forest that he's in, it has become, I guess, corrupted in a sense where like the water is uh, stagnant and it's not pure and there's only evil things living in it and uh, the creatures can't necessarily drink it and be healthy. And, you know, it's just not, times are not very good. 
Um, right. Does that, that seem like the, it's, that's that way to you? Yeah, essentially, um, the and, and one of the, the pillars of this game is the heartwarming themes that they have. They, they had that in the first game as well. And it was nice to see in this one where the introduction shows the owl being hatched and they're trying to teach the owl how to fly. You can see how the, the owl has one of, its, one of its wings is lame. And so they're, they're still trying to do what they can in order to let the owl f- have its flying adventures. And so it's a, it's a very simple premise where as the owl takes on its first successful flight, they run into some turbulent weather and then the both Ori and the owl get separated as they fall down to like some unknown locations. So one of the things that I think is really cool about the sequel is they have actually put in quite a few secondary characters that you come across. Have you played the game uh, very much at this point or not? I, well, I thought I did. That's funny because I've, I've played it every evening since Wednesday and a little bit yesterday afternoon. And I ran across a creature who says, Hey, you know, I finally get a chance to meet you. And I noticed, I noticed you were in the forest and uh, that you're a spirit of the forest and whatever. And I've just been tracking your progress and here's what I found. And it basically shows you like how long you've been playing the game. And um, you know, people, creatures you've, you've, uh, met and how many times you've died, how many, um, life cubes you've got, you know, it's just all your stats. And I thought I'm getting close to the end of the game. And then it only told me I'm 14% of the way done. I thought that's it. Like there's an achievement where you can finish the game in four hours. And so I thought I'd, I'd probably be near close to the end, but I don't know if 14% is doing everything you can possibly do in the game or 14% is, you know, point A from the story to point Z. But <laughs> so I guess I'm a qu- I'm close to a quarter of the way through. I don't know. Yeah, the Ori titles are very generous in terms of their length. The, the first Ori was also quite long. And this one looks like it's going to be just as big, if not bigger, which I love because I think that sometimes if you have these smaller productions – perhaps the story doesn't last as long as we would like, uh, even if the story is fantastic and that sort of thing. But Ori, yeah, you will be busy for some time. And it's not just the length of the game, but it's also the difficulty. It is a a game that harkens back to the old school difficulties of the 8-bit and 16-bit days. So you will be tested as you move forward. But having said that, it is a very fair difficulty. It's It's the type of game that as you get better and better using the abilities that you unlock, and you're going to unlock a ton of different abilities as you make your way through the game. There will be certain times where you're going to be dying and having to start um, back a little ways over and over and over. But what's super cool about Ori is that you have an infinite amount of lives. It's not like you have three lives and then if you lose those, it's game over. You literally will continue to respawn in basically the same area that you were trying to to overcome, and that's cool because you it it never loses the momentum that you were having as you were making your way through it, and so I think that's that's super cool. I don't know if I've actually met the character that you're describing. I've met about three other characters. And they all have different types of purposes for existing in the world. Some of them will teach you certain abilities. Some will offer you different types of items that you can purchase. And I, I for one, really like that because the first Ori was such a, a lonely adventure where, like, you're you're kind of on your own and, like, every type of creature that you come across is, like, some sort of hostile creature. And it makes sense because of what the the setup was but when it comes to the sequel i for one i'm glad to see that yeah there are these other characters and they're all really cool i love the art direction on the characters as well as their voices and stuff and i think that's that is a lot of fun speaking of art direction this game is i mean i of course i've seen the trailers and that sort of thing but can we just say how absolutely gorgeous this game is Oh my goodness. You can make posters out of almost every screenshot that the game shows you. It's, it's that beautiful. I mean, I, I was mystified by the title screen about what the, the, the leaves and the branches and the, the, the foliage 
in the foreground and in the background. And I thought, man, this is, this is absolutely beautiful. And with, with the, uh, with the, the singing also and the wind blowing. And I mean that it just kind of that, that background. It's almost, what's her name? She's, she sang in the Lord of the Rings. I think it was, it was, um, oh man, I'm going to butcher it. Yeah. I think it was on, 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 ye? on, ye? on, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look it up, but, um, <laughs> Anyhow, it sounds like a variant of her singing throughout the the title screen, and with the plush colors and and environments that you're in. I mean, I, I've played the game. No, I wouldn't say loud, but I haven't played it quiet. But it's been like background music in the house, and I've checked with my wife. I'm like, I'm sorry if I'm playing this too loud. I I, did, I, I don't I hope I'm not just you know distracting you from whatever you're trying to get done. And she goes, actually, no, it's actually very soothing music. I've enjoyed listening to you play all you know in different yeah you know, when, while I'm cleaning this that or the other or working on uh you know different uh, stuff I have to do for uh like tax or taxes and stuff. So. Uh, she, she's actually enjoyed both me watch, you know, watching me play the game and uh, just listening to the game in whatever room she's in in the house. So, I mean, completely different type of game that, than other stuff that I've been playing that she's <laughs> had to endure. Yeah. Have you come across Howl yet? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, okay. I've come across Howl. Yeah, I've, I've uh, vanquished him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have not uh, vanquished him. I I was able to beat him back temporarily, but there was no like actual vanquishing, vanquishing. And I w- the reason I ask is so one of the the things that I think is just exceptional about this title is how they incorporate the background, midground, and foreground areas. And so you will see, like for instance, with the the, the Howl character that you'll meet early on. I, I don't know if you, you probably saw this, but it, you'll notice at one point that he is stalking you in the background. Right. And then all yeah. of a sudden, like, like he'll come and, and uh, leap from the mid ground into the foreground and that sort of thing. Ori in the blind forest did the same thing with some of its boss type of characters as well. And I love that because it no longer just, um, remains as set dressing. We're like, Oh, you know, we have this parallax world and there are the background elements that just kind of move a little bit here and there, but are mostly static. It it actually becomes that much more of an immersive environment. And there are moments too, where Ori will also kind of plunge into the, the Z axis space, if you will, where they'll go into the area that's the background and that sort of thing. So that way you're not constantly thinking that this is a 2d title that you're moving left or right. And, uh, and even when it comes to some of the other like secondary characters or even the, just the background action and the foreground action, I absolutely love how a lot of attention has been placed on some of like the looping animations and the way the lighting, like if there's certain light that comes in and how it affects those areas as well. It's not just limited to where Ori's path is. But when it comes to the the music as well, yeah, the music itself um, is so heartfelt and really well done. And and that's how the first game was as well. So I'm curious to know exactly where you are. I I think what's interesting, too, about a game like Ori and the Will of the Wisps is it's not strictly linear. You can actually choose certain paths to take and, and different things to do and unlock because I feel like I've seen and done certain things that you haven't and vice versa, where like, like if you actually took out Howl for real, like, you know, how, you know, how you have that first encounter with the torch and you kind of like scare him away for a while. Right. So it makes me curious, like how on earth did you find Howl again? And I don't even know where it is that you did find Howl. And meanwhile, I've been like totally exploring all these other places and areas and it does have kind of that Super Metroid approach to how like you'll see certain areas that you can't get to and you wonder how on earth can you get that cool item or whatever. And you realize, oh, I'm sure once I unlock a certain ability, suddenly I can revisit this same place and I'll probably be able to achieve getting to that spot, so to speak. Yeah, well, I may have to back up. I mean, I, I that, so when you have the torch and you, you, bust a, a cap on him 
via torch. Uh, that's that's where that's what I meant by Vang. I don't think I have faced him again. I've I've been going back and forth because I've been stuck quite a few times. But I, that's what, so. I don't know if there if he does come back and you have to to beat him. You, I, I've definitely gone to his lair. Uh, and he is not there. So I don't know if the fact is that uh, you beat him back enough and he's now licking his wounds and will uh, leave you well alone or that you have to go back and beat him. But that's what I did. I, I set him on fire in a sense. I, I, uh-huh. I singed his whiskers and now he is gone. So um, the I have discovered quite a bit of the map. I don't know if you keep on going up or down, but uh, or just across. But I've I have quite a bit of the map uh, I've discovered. I have so you have your little sword ability, uh, which I thought was pretty cool because I don't know how I was going to defend myself after I didn't have the torch. And I thought also like, okay, I'm going to have to keep on finding torches to <laughs> defend myself because that's going to suck. Uh, and so then I got my little sword ability. And then I got the ability where um, I have like this more of like a uh, like a hammer pound in a way, uh, which I've been using quite a lot. And I have the double jump ability. And I have the ability to now stick on walls. So I, instead of like having before, how do you have to kind of do a bunch of jumps to get up where you wanted to get? I can now um, I can stick on walls and just climb them. And I have the ability where I can do a dart where it's like a, a quick sprint if you're on the ground. And if you're in the air, you just kind of dart across the air real quick, which has been able, I've been able to, oh, you know what else I have also is the ability to, sometimes um, there's these lanterns that are hung on vines. And I, have I know the ability exactly to now, what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I, you can actually dart off those. So I don't know how they made this, whatever, but certain projectiles, shiny projectiles that are shot at you and uh, certain lit lit objects, you can uh, jump on them. Kind of like in, it's it's like the parry in, um, oh, what's the game? Cuphead. Uh, Cuphead, yes. Uh, it's like the parry, where, but it, 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 it makes you jump further uh, or in a different direction. So it's like a ricochet almost. So I have that ability also. And, um, I mean, some parts of the game, it, it doesn't exactly tell you what you're supposed to do. You just kind of have to mistakenly find out. I mean, the, when I first found that, that, that parry move, I, th- I thought, oh, it just affects the way I jump, but maybe I skip past the instructions too quick or something. I don't know, but, um, I'm like, where am I supposed to go? And I've, I've, and I've gone every place I can go to uh, in the map. And I can't, I'm, I'm so lost. Like, what am I supposed to do? And it turns out there were certain parts of the wall that were weak that you could not destroy, but certain projectiles that were uh, thrown at you, you can ricochet those and those will bust through the wall. And I didn't know that until I mistakenly just happened to, I don't know, do something I didn't intend to do. And I thought, well, that blew up the wall. That might unlock a different area of the map. And I did that. And I was like, oh. Well, there you go. Okay, well, I guess I'm I'm no longer stuck. But there was another uh, person that I met, or he says, "Hey, like you get like certain ore uh, material that you can you can make stuff with, or you meet somebody later on that he allegedly can make stuff." And one of the things he said was, "Oh, you know what I can do if I get a, you know enough ore is I can get rid of all the vines, or not the vines, the uh, the thorns." And I thought, yes. Please do that. There's thorns everywhere. And so then I <laughs> I paid him to do that. And all he did was clear off one little section close to him of the thorns and no other thorns in the in the forest <laughs> were cleared. I'm like, dude, you just You're said like, you were is- going to get rid of all the thorns. This is false advertising. Exactly. So anyhow. I mean, uh, it, I mean, did some parts of the game it does it's not real clear on exactly what you're supposed to do. And you just kind of have to um, experiment and then find your way, I guess. But anyhow. Well, and I think that that's one of the strengths of the title. I like not having someone constantly tell me where to go or what to do next. I like the idea of being able to explore. And like you said, almost mistakenly discover something because I think that's that's kind of part of the the process, right? That's kind of the the organic quality of the title where you're kind of lost and instead of constantly being dependent on someone 
telling you where you should go next or what you should do. Just go off on your own little adventure and figure out what you're going to do. And I, and I do think that that does also play into kind of the, the world that they've created where it's these animals, it's these creatures you're in the wild and I want to fe- have at times kind of a sensation of being rather lost because that is more of the, the immersive quality. And, and plus too, they reward you all the time for going to places that you're not exactly sure what to expect or whatever. They have a lot of fun little treasures and stuff that will help your character in the long term. But when it comes to the title overall, I am absolutely floored. I am so happy. I think that this title came at such a perfect time, especially given the fact that uh, the world is going through the, the, the quarantine shutdown situation right now. I think that if you're a gamer that turning to your, your system and being able to play games is um, just a, a wonderful way to, to, kill the time and be able to be with your family and that sort of thing. And I think Ori is 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 one such title where if things continue to to be more dire that I think this game will keep you busy for probably a couple of months. I imagine depending on how difficult things get, not to mention like all the other types of uh, games that are going to be coming out shortly as well. I think I, I do. It's times like this where it's like, yeah, you know, I'm really glad I, I love video games. Don't you agree? No, oh, I would wholeheartedly agree. I would even go further to say uh, so far this year, it, Ori is my, my favorite game thus far. Um, I would say that, you know, with all, with tons of games that I've been playing where you're uh, hacking and slashing uh, fools, <laughs> You know, <laughs> stabbing stormtroopers in the chest and uh, and evil baddies of, of from whatever dimension are coming to kill you. Uh, <laughs> there's there's a place for that too. Powers. There's a place for that too, I guess. But um, it's so nice to have play a game where it, which is more peaceful. I would say um, not as violent. Um, <laughs> and the art style is as just is is beautiful. The music is beautiful. Um, and I, I love the way they've animated Ori. I mean, if I have to go uh, traverse one side of the map and then go traverse the complete opposite side, um, the the abilities that you get are easy to master. And he just the way they animate him is I don't know how to really describe it. It's it's very like effortless. Uh, where he does look like he's a small little creature. He's darting around. Looks like if he was an and actually existed. That's the way he would, uh, he would move. Um, and that's kind of funny to say, but I've, I guess I've, I've been um, going backwards and forwards so much on the map that I haven't, I, I didn't, I'm not, I'm, what am I trying to say? I'm not tired of the way he's, he, he's, he moves or he jumps or he dashes or he climbs. Like it, it's so cute that I haven't gotten tired of, of, of how he is animated. Um, and I, I mean, like how the, the creatures don't actually speak your language. They, you have to read subtitles. They speak their own little, uh, language, whatever it is. Uh, I like that. I mean, I love this, the, the, whatever's happening in the background. I mean, there, there's a part where you meet up with this bigger creature and it just comes up out of nowhere and you're like, oh my gosh, like I didn't expect that. Everything has been so small lately. Um, but any, any part that you are in, in the forest, it's not you know, ugly. It, even though the forest is corrupt in a way, it's it's either beautiful or hauntingly beautiful. But either way, it's 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 very well done. And I mean, it's on. You know, it's free if you have Game Pass. So if you have Game Pass, you, I mean, you definitely don't want to pass this up. You definitely want to download it. Um, even if you don't like it, it's definitely worth your time to to experiment with it to see what it's all about. Because if you have Game Pass, it's free. You could always delete it. But um, anyhow, I I. I uh, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I think it's a welcome relief. I think it's a breath of fresh air and and I'm enjoying every minute of it. Nice. I do think it's worth mentioning too, before we sign off here that um, moon studios, who's the, the developer behind Ori in the blind forest, as well as Ori in the will of the wisps, they had to, they were in development for five years on this title and all of their employees work from home. Oh, I was wow. reading, yeah, I was reading a, an article on LinkedIn actually, and they were interviewing the CEO of the company. And it's amazing how he was talking about over time, 
even before he formed the studio, he used to work over at Blizzard Entertainment. And what was interesting was that he actually had hired some of the folks from Blizzard to work on on the Ori series, as well as other um, creatives um, in the industry as well. And how the people who work on the game, they live all over the world. It's an international team. And yet they have been able to produce such a a triple a quality title, despite the fact that no one is in the same room as the other. And then of course, you know, they, they have like video conferencing and that sort of thing when they have their meetings. And he did talk about how they'll have these sporadic team get togethers where, where they'll pick some sort of fun location for the entire team to come meet up. And what, but what they'll do is they'll hang out at like a resort or something for like a week and they'll play games together. They'll talk about ideas. They'll have that FaceTime in person to be able to build those bonds and be able to come up with different types of uh, approaches as to how they, they want to explore something for or like a feature in the game, that sort of thing. But I do think it's a testament to what the future can potentially hold for a lot of different studios. And of course, not to constantly go back to the uh, the coronavirus situation but i think one of the the potential silver linings of this whole situation is that the companies at large it doesn't matter which industry you are in but due to the fact that they're being forced into having to to come up with a work from home solution for the majority of their employees i think that's a welcome thing because we are at a point at, as a society, as well as technology, where you can actually have a business be run from your home. And don't get me wrong, there are certain things that will be a lot more beneficial if you do it in person. But I do think that with regards to how far technology is today and like what and just just the trend, the trend of 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 what um, a, a, an employee is capable of doing from home, as long as they don't get distracted and they're able to meet their deadlines on time and have their deliverables, then it actually really does open the door for a lot of different situations. Cause if you think about it, traditionally speaking, when it comes to a job, employees tend to have to wrestle with the idea of, well, do I need to move my house and my family to another state for a job or, when it comes to work visas, if you have talent that perhaps is from a different country and you're trying to figure out how on earth can we get this person over here and everything else, well, you can circumvent all of those types of red tape situations by just having a work from home type of ideology. And I think when it comes to the smaller studios and smaller companies, you are seeing more and more of them have this type of approach because then it just opens the door in terms of who they can hire and who can be Uh, contributing to these different projects. And that's a really exciting thing just because you no longer have to give up on someone who perhaps is a much stronger candidate for what it is that you're looking for. So my hat goes off to moon studios on a fantastic title. I'm going to be having a blast playing through this game as I'm sure you are as well. And um, I, it's going to be a long wait if they decide to do a part three to this title, because it'll probably be another five years or so. But as long as they're working on something, I think uh, I'm going to be one happy man. That wraps up this episode of Joygasm. Make sure you tune in next week. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to check out patreon.com slash joygasm, which is spelled J O Y. G-A-S-M and consider becoming a monthly contributor. You'll get exclusive perks and early access to the show. Not to mention, it really helps us continue doing what we love to do. Also, you can follow us on social media and YouTube. Just do a search for Joygasm TV. Stay healthy, everybody.